there is a world in which I am wearing a finished no frills cardigan right now and regrettably that's not the world that we're in. Hi, hello, my name is Allie and this is my channel where I talk about what I'm knitting, how it's going and what it's costing me. I'm coming to you today from just outside Toronto with my mug from Hoya Atelier, which just like look how pretty it is. And in it, I'm drinking my usual, this is getting really old, Sloan Classic Earl Grey. Um, it's an oldie but a goodie, I don't know. Today I'm also wearing something we've seen on the channel before because I'm in my repeat era. This is my quilted sweater coat by Alexander Tavel and its sizing accommodates up to between a 59 and a 65 inch bust just depending on how much of the range of the recommended positive ease that you want to have. I knit the size 2 because my, my gauge was coming out tight as usual. This is before I'd figured out that you can just like adjust your needle sizes. Fun fact if you didn't know that. So I was actually aiming for closer to a size 1 but I knit size 2 to kind of compensate. And and I knit this between April and May of 2022. So I've had this for a solid two years now, which is wild because I don't even like feel like I've been knitting that long. I mean, obviously I have, but I started knitting in February of 2022. So this was very early. This was my first like garment. Like before that, I'd only knit kind of like test swatches and then a headband. And so this was my first like anything that remotely approached a sweater. Um, so I was very excited about it and I still, I get a lot of wear out of this because you know what? I have worn this 86 times and since the materials for this one cost me just under $160, my current cost per wear is $1.83, which like, considering that this has clearly become kind of a wardrobe staple, not even I would say a wardrobe staple so much as like a household staple because I kind of just throw this on over anything when I'm at home and I get cold, like I feel like that cost per wear is, it's gonna be really good <laughs> by the time this thing's falling apart. And I really love it. So I feel like that's probably gonna be the only reason that I stop wearing it. Okay, so let's get into whips. So do I have a finished no frill cardigan to show you if I'm skipping the finished object section? No, and here's, <laughs> we were so close. There is a world in which I'm wearing a finished no frills cardigan right now. And I'm telling you that it's done and Regrettably, that's not the world that we're in, so let me catch you up. <laughs> so I am knitting the No Frills Cardigan by Petite Knit. This is a pattern that is size inclusive up to a 59 inch bust. Need just a little bit more there, please. I am knitting the size extra small, and this pattern cost me about nine Canadian dollars once it was converted from Danish Kroner. There it was, 45. I'm knitting this out of, I did not have it with me today to show you, so I will just hold up. <laughs> This is the combo of the We Are Knitters Touch Me Mohair in the color Mustard and the Knitting for Olive Merino also in the color Mustard. Now all in with the pattern and the yarn, this has cost me about $240 Canadian or $175 US, which is a lot, but it's also a lot of cardigan as you will see in a moment and possibly too much as you will again see in a moment. So I have knit this on 4.5 millimeter needles instead of four millimeter to compensate for my ever tight gauge. So I cast this on January 5th, which a very long time ago and it is a if i can even find the top of it there's so much fabric you guys it is a top down raglan construction cardigan and you knit the button band um at the same time as you're knitting everything else now where where are we with this cardigan we are at should be done <laughs> we are at um i did the pockets there's a pocket i knit all the length. I knit three inches of ribbing. You'll recall last time I was measuring to figure out when I should start the ribbing, realized there's way more ribbing than I was thinking. There's, I think, three and a half inches of ribbing. I was like, oh, I didn't realize that. I should rip back. So I ripped back two inches and then started the ribbing. And then I decided to block before casting off because I just do not wish to spend the probably several hours that doing a sewn bind off is going to take me to do and then find out that it's too long. Boy, am I glad I did that <laughs> because guess what? It's too long. I mean, so current, currently it's not currently I'll try it on in a second to show you, but currently it's probably like an inch off the ground at the front because just the way it kind of sits on the body and like, it makes sense because the front panels aren't like holding on to the other side to keep it up. Those front corners kind of droop. So those front corners are about an inch off the ground and I just feel like that just seems really close to assume that over time, like some stretch in this garment isn't gonna, like even if I just like put something in the pocket, it basically hits the ground. I mean, depending what it is, but like, 
I don't I don't think I want to like make a habit of leaving my phone in that pocket because it's quite heavy and like I find the phone like knits like weighs down knit garments quite a lot it also just makes it look lopsided because the other side <laughs> won't be pulled down that way but I would like to be able to do it like sometimes just like briefly as I'm like doing something and I would like that to not immediately have my cardigan dragging on the floor so I think I need to remove length now the question is at this point I have a few different options of how I think that I could do that that I need to kind of think through but before I do that let's try this on and talk about it I need to back all the way up so you can see the bottom I think you can see the bottom if I go over here you can see the bottom better so just like on its own for its own sake I love that I think that looks fantastic but you know what I don't think will look fantastic is frayed edges on my cardigan that make it start to unravel. So I think that part of what happened is that I think the pockets are adding a not insubstantial amount of weight that is kind of pulling them down more than anticipated because I, I did like quite a lot of like testing to try to prevent this problem. Right? So I, I think when it was about here, I blocked it and measured what kind of percentage growth that I got. And based on that, I had calculated that anything that I knit from there should not grow by any substantial amount because it was going to be significantly less length from there on. It should have been like maybe half an inch. It should have been very, very little. I also tested just hanging this off of the back of a chair for a few days to try to give it a chance for like gravity to settle in and find out how much of a difference it sagging under its own weight was going to make. All of these tests led me to believe that I didn't have a whole lot to worry about. <laughs> so I kept knitting and knit until I knit too long. And then I ripped back and then I knit my, my ribbing and then I blocked it again. And I just, I don't know. I feel like it somehow still came out too long. <laughs> so. The good news is I think I had talked in a previous video about being worried that the sleeves were too long, but I'm finding actually that the, and the recording was interrupted by a <laughs> grocery delivery, <laughs> which I had to answer a phone call. So hopefully um, the frame hasn't shifted too much. We'll pretend that didn't happen. So I actually feel like the sleeves are a good length because the cuffs are so like nice and tight that like, they actually don't just like slide down over my hands, but I can like tuck myself into them if I want to, which is like my ideal sleeve quality, right? Like I actually, I kind of have the problem with my um, quilted sweater jacket where the sleeves are both long and the cuff isn't very tight. So they do kind of flop over my hands in this way where like, I kind of feel like I'm a child wearing my mother's clothing. <laughs> but these actually just like sit in this really nice cozy way that I really like. So I think I'm actually gonna leave those as is. And in terms of the pockets, so last time I was talking about being a little bit scared <laughs> doing the pockets. Um, so I did pockets and the world didn't blow up. So nailed it. Also, I was talking about pocket positioning and how the pattern basically said that they should be basically half the length from the underarm that they currently are. And I was like, that seems really high. And I decided to move them way down and I was like, am I moving these down too much? Like this seems extreme, but I don't know. It seems like the right place. I will say, I think that they ended up being a little bit lower than I expected just because I think the like the pocket itself kind of like weighs things down a little, but like very much still within the realm of like a place where I'm happy to have a pocket and much happier than if they were halfway up <laughs> from where they currently are. I definitely would have found that to be a weird place. And I do find this to be a comfortable place for them. So I am very happy with that. And we'll note for the future that maybe next time just put them like an inch higher than I think that I should just to account for like the drag of the whole situation. But very pleased with that. Very pleased that I didn't end up accidentally unraveling my whole cardigan when I had to make a cut to put an after that pocket. So big fan, big fan of that. So we are at this really weird part of this project where it's like the only part I have not done is the bind off, but I think I need to do some undoing before I do the bind off. And so here, here's the question. This has a quite generous three and a half inch ribbing at the bottom and the button band or lack of button band is 
maybe like an inch wide and it's the same ribbing it flows directly into the ribbing at the bottom so to me option number one door number one is i just rip back the ribbing until its length matches the width of the button band because i think that would also look quite nice and polished i like how this looks but i don't think that i like it more than i would like that i think that as long as it matches this it would feel nice and uniform and feel intentional so the question there is just will that be enough removed right i have to figure out how much of this i want to remove and i guess i'm concerned about the possibility of going to the trouble of putting in this lifeline of ripping back and making sure I get all the right rib stitches on my needle because this would mean picking up ribbing and potentially still feeling like I don't know if I took enough off. So that's that's door number one and my concerns with door number one. Door number two, I unravel all of the ribbing and a little bit of the stockinette and start the ribbing sooner. And now that still begs the question of do I rip back enough of the stockinette that I still am doing a three and a half inch rib? Or am I just ripping back enough that I do a shorter, like roughly one inch rib? So there's like door 2A and door 2B. <laughs> and then door three is I actually do surgery and I actually cut off the bottom ribbing. I rip back some of the stockinette and then I graft them back together. There's a lot of like pros and cons here because I was gonna say in my ideal world it would still have three and a half inches of ribbing but like do I feel like that? I don't know like I don't actually know that I feel like that looks any better than that would. I think I just feel that because that's how it is in the pattern so I'm like ideally it would be what the pattern says and I wouldn't feel like I'd like cheated in some way but I don't know if I, if I were to rank my um feelings toward these various processes um things i like the most knitting stockinette knitting ribbing putting in a lifeline in stockinette putting in a lifeline on ribbing grafting but if we rank how long each of these would take to solve the same problem if fastest is up here I think grafting is the fastest. Actually, that's not true. The fastest solution would just be ripping back a couple inches of the ribbing and leaving it at one inch ribbing, assuming that that's enough length removed, right? That's the caveat. That's the potential problem with door number one. Door number one is the fastest, and if it works, is the best all around, because it also doesn't involve any methods that are really annoying to me, other than that I would have to put in a lifeline and ribbing. But short of that, door number three is probably the next best option, time-wise, because door number two means ripping back all of this ribbing and some stockinette and having to spend some hours re-knitting ribbing. <laughs> so I, I haven't figured out which of these I'm gonna do in part because I'm really torn about how much length I think I need to remove, but I'm not really sure how to make myself more sure about this. <laughs> like maybe if I, can I like pin it so that it's at the length it would be like this? Like, can I like pin it like that? And then, but even that, I feel like that, there's still a weight factor, right? Where like, well, once I rip it off, that fabric won't be weighing it down like that. And then, I don't know. I don't know, I don't know. I just want it to magically be the right length. <laughs> I don't currently know the best way to do that. I have a few different options. Um, but I am thinking I would like to, I think before I do that, get everything else about this garment ready to go. So I would like to have all my ends woven in. I've started that already. I've done quite a lot of them, but not all of them. I, <laughs> I've skipped the ones that I need to do the most strategically. They're less fun and more stressful. So for example, um, around the underarm, because I do kind of have some little itty bitty holes um, kind of where I picked up for the sleeves that I would like to use those ends to kind of cinch up, right? And I also, <laughs> turns out, have the exact same problem at the pockets where you can see um where the pocket mm, mm, mm. you can see where the pocket is pulling on like it's kind of widening pulling those stitches apart so i would like to use those ends to kind of cinch up those holes keep everything nice and tight and clean looking but that just requires like a little more brain power and it's not just like bleh, 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 bleh. so i need to do those still so i think i would like to do all of that so that when i remove the extra length 
And when I bind it all off, I can just be done. Now, barring, barring another blocking, because I think, I don't know, I've seen like conflicting opinions on whether you should block before or after you weave in your ends. And I used to block at the very, very end. I would weave in everything first. And I did that for a lot of my projects, but then I saw it suggested that you actually block before you weave in ends so that the tension is kind of evened out and your woven in ends haven't prevented the ability of the yarn to even itself out. Like if something is kind of like, like if it's kind of run out of length that it would have otherwise kind of borrowed because that end has been woven in and you can kind of weave it in after you've seen where everything wants to settle. But in doing that, I don't know, I feel like, I feel like weaving in those ends adds its own like little tension things where like you can see a little bit in the fabric and I feel like blocking can help even that out a little bit. And I don't know, I don't feel like I, I don't feel like I really like had issues when I was blocking after weaving in ends. So maybe I need to go back to that because even if it doesn't disguise the kind of like micro tension differences of having woven in ends. It does at least kind of like soften those ends a little. Like I found that um, when I was weaving in ends, I had to weave in one of my sleeves, but one of them I guess I had like done at the time, just like as soon as I finished it. And just the difference from one to the other, like I, on the sleeve that I just wove in the ends, I feel like I can very clearly see it, right? Like I can barely clearly see this stitch column is like thicker. I can see where I wove those in. And on the other sleeve, I was just checking to make sure I'm like, is there really not an end I need to weave in over here somewhere? And I was looking all around the cuff and it really took me like a while to like notice, like, okay, it is here. I can see that that's thicker, but it just, because it's sort of flattened down into the fabric more, it just feels less obtrusive. So. That makes me feel like I need to block after I weave in ends. So all this to say, this guardian has now already been blocked twice because I did a mid-project block and then I blocked it when I thought I was done just to double check the length, thankfully. And now I'm like, I think that after I weave in all the ends, I'm going to want to block it again because like, I, I don't know, I feel like all the spots that I've woven in ends, I can like very subtly see them and I don't love that and I would like to see if blocking it again will help that a little bit. I also need to, on this one, sew in one of my tags because I had tags made a while ago to sew into my knitting pieces and I forgot to do this on my dog walking gloves. I should really do that because I got like little ones intended for accessories as well. And I need to start incorporating these into my finished pieces and I really need to go back and add them to my other ones that I'd done before I got these, but I don't like sewing. So I need to work on that. <laughs> but that's, that's the current state of this. It's a very, we're so close yet so far. And I don't know, I have not yet decided which door I'm gonna go with. So um, let me know if you have a strong opinion. Let me know what you do. I need to look at the length of this again. Because really this depends on how much length I need to remove. How much length do I need to remove? How much too long is it? Like that bottom, here, the other problem is that it's very hard to measure because as soon as I bend down, it goes down. <laughs> so how far is that from the floor? I don't even know. I think it's like an inch, but it's very hard to tell from this angle. So if I actually, maybe looking at this footage will be helpful to me to get over here to make sure it's all in frame. Okay, if I remove two inches from this, is that enough length removed? Oh, I should probably stop holding my shoulders up also. That's another problem. Oh yeah, it's much closer to the ground when I put my shoulders down. <laughs> Standing like this, if I remove two inches, slouch. I slouch a lot. Can I slouch? How close is it to the ground now? Oh, that's very close. How much do I have to rip off for this to be the right length? Future self, report in. Okay, and then next up for whips, I have an update on my cloud bow top, which is a lot more substantial than the last time that it was on the channel. There's also a lot of needles attached to it right now, so let me see if I can 
make sense of this. So actually maybe before I try to make sense of this, I will tell you, I am knitting the cloud bow top by Reed Keys. This is a pattern that has both a dress version and a top version, but I'm knitting the top. This is a pattern that's inclusive up to between a 62 and a 66 inch bust, depending on how much of the intended ease that you want, which I think is great. And I'm knitting the size three. I think typically I would have knit the size two, but again, gauge coming up small. For some reason, I thought that this project would be immune to that problem because it's like a very fine yarn on a very big needle. Turns out that doesn't impact anything at all. I don't know. <laughs> so I'm knitting the size three. The good news is that the size two and the size three start out the same and it just kind of impacts um, things that you, by the time you're doing them, would have knit enough that it basically functions as a gauge left and so you know. Um, so I'm doing the size three for that reason. Now this pattern was a pricey one because it's from Pom Pom Magazine, which means that I had to buy like the whole magazine. So it was 11 Great British Pounds, which converted out to 1942 Canadian. So I am hoping that I will knit other things out of there. There are other things in there that I like. Realistically, are those things going to make it to the top of my knit pile at some point? Like that's hard to say. I feel like my knitting queue it's always shifting, right? There are things always kind of hovering around the periphery where it's like, oh, I think I'd really like to knit that next. But then like, there is time that elapses in between now and when I'm next looking to cast something on. And sometimes other things have popped up and priorities have shifted. So TBD, whether the cost of this pattern ever ends up getting split between other projects. But for now, the pattern was 20 bucks and that's pricey. And speaking of sort of ever-changing priorities of what you're knitting next, this whole project is only happening because I went to Knit City Toronto where I purchased this yarn from The Wandering Flock. This is their 80% Super Kid Mohair, 20% Silk Base in the color Cosmic Tie-Dye. And it's beautiful. Look at it. Like I just, I could not resist it and therefore <laughs> I had to come up with something to make out of it. So here we are knitting the cloud bow. Now these skeins were $48 a piece and with tax the total came out to 108.48 Canadian. We have a copper. So all in my total project costs including the pattern is 127.90 Canadian or $94 US. Now I am knitting this on a 6.5 millimeter needle as written in the pattern though again maybe I shouldn't have. I probably should have sized up but here's my problem though. I actually did consider when I was moving on to the next section, which will make more sense in a second. I considered upping my needle size there because I don't think it would have been obvious that I had changed needle size between these two pieces and it could have just alleviated some of that problem for me later. Um, but when I was looking at my interchangeable needle set, I have the uh, Luca Cypress set and they actually jumped from 6.5 millimeters to 8 millimeters, which is like a pretty substantial difference. Like I was hoping to go to like maybe 7 millimeters. So I felt like one and a half millimeters would probably then make my gauge too open it would overcompensate for the problem that I was having and maybe actually would be enough of a difference that it would be noticeably different also so I don't even feel bad about not gauge swatching because what would I have done what would I have done differently I mean like I guess I could have bought a set of seven millimeter needles but like I don't know I have a beautiful set of needles that I love to use that was expensive and like I don't know, buying needles specific for a project seems silly to me, particularly when like I am hoping that like this is going to work out just fine. Like I don't think that I am not going to be able to knit this. I think that between going up a size and probably just knitting like a few more rows for length, like I, I think it's going to be just fine. So I think 6.5 millimeters was the right decision, even if it makes me a little bit nervous, just based on the way that this garment is constructed where for a little bit I couldn't really in any way try it on but we are at a point now where I can try it on and I feel like I can see like okay I think I think it's gonna be good it's it's still a little unclear but I think it's gonna be good now I cast this on May 25th I'm recording this on June 19th the date is it today yes June 19th <laughs> so let me show you where we've gotten okay so the last time that I showed this it was two unattached rectangles they were basically like really airy dishcloths <laughs> and those pieces are now so this this is one of those rectangles this is another one of those rectangles and they are now attached by a sleeve <laughs> so um this is tricky because this fabric is so light and there are like needles dangling off of it that's really like weighing it down and i also have needles up here because so you knit the front panel you knit the back panel but these panels are smaller than typical front and back panels because the sleeve it's this huge billowy sleeve that actually connects and kind of is part of the body like the sleeve and the side body are all kind of one piece 
so you can see let me show you so the sleeve join doesn't actually start until here but i have been knitting in the direction of the sleeve since here so start of side body area start of actual sleeve so these few inches is all side body and so in the pattern it gives instructions for two different lengths of sleeves it gives oh needles get out of there don't pull that it gives instructions for like a full length sleeve and also for a sort of like long t-shirt ish length sleeve um and i tried this on the other day just to see how far away my sleeve was from being done and i actually really like the length it was at at sort of like a three-quarter length and i'm debating leaving it there but i'm hesitant to conclude that without knowing exactly how it's going to sit and i won't know exactly how it's going to sit until it has a neck and really until it has the other arm also but i also <laughs> am hesitant to break the yarn on this unnecessarily because i feel like in a fabric this open it's harder to like weave in ends in a way that's not noticeable like, I feel like the fabric will just look noticeably more full in that area. I don't know. So, I <laughs> I haven't broke it yet. And actually, what I, what I was hoping to do is, you can see I already have the needles in here up top, because I went around and picked up stitches for the neck. But what I realized was that where I joined the two panels that don't have a side, like, they're joined very closely together. And when I get to this side where the sleeve is because of the sleeve and kind of the dimensionality that it's added in, I'm going to need to pick up a few more stitches just kind of at the top of that arm that will then be part of the neck to kind of keep everything together and not have like a weird hole at the top of my shoulder. And so I'm realizing that I will also need those few extra stitches on the other side. And I don't think that I will be able to like accurately do that in a way that will match the other sleeve without having the other sleeve picked up and at least started first. I don't want the two shoulder caps to end up like looking very <laughs> different from each other. So I picked up, but I think I think those needles are just gonna have to stay in the neck for a while. I think what I actually need to do is just pick up and start the other sleeve. And part of my other debate is, do I break the yarn to do that? Or I do have a second skein of the mohair. So I could just wind that up and start the sleeve with that so and then leave the other ball attached so that I'm not actually breaking the yarn which would be best on the not breaking yarn front however I don't I'm I don't really know if I'm actually going to need the second skein for this I probably will if I knew for sure that I was going to need to tap into the second skein I think I would be more willing to do that I just, on the chance that I don't need it I don't really want to end up with like two half used balls and then I also like if yarn is going to sit in my stash, I feel like I learned from winding up my Hedgehog Fibers yarn. Fun yarn just looks so much nicer in a hank than it does in a cake. And there's something about the like allure of using a yarn, even if it's stuck around in your collection for a while. Like I think it just holds more of that new yarn excitement if it's still like pristine in the hank. You know what I mean? So if I'm going to have a bunch of this left over and it could have just been like a perfect hank, I feel like I would rather leave it that way so that it is more like fun and enticing. You know, a year from now when I like come up with something I want to do with it. I don't know. This is very like when my niece was little, she was obsessed with Play-Doh, but not playing with it. She just wanted to like take it out of the container and just like look at how perfect and untouched it was. <laughs> and I feel like this is a trait we have in common. I feel like I'm seeing this playing out right now. I don't know. I don't know what to do about it. So let me see if I can try this on. So you can you can really see here um, the side body thing that I was talking about. So like you can see where the stitches switch direction, right? So the front panel was this and then stitches are picked up along the side to start going this way. And then after a few inches, you join in the round and that becomes the sleeve. And then there's actually no decreases. I've just been knitting straight on this. So you can see how like comically small the front panel would have seemed when I was knitting it like relative to the body that it was going to have to fit. But I do think that it gives this really cute kind of like structured look to what is otherwise a very like flowy garment but it's just kind of like a cute detail and let me let me stand up so you can actually see the full length of this oh god oh no okay so like i feel like that's a really cute sleeve length do we agree like 
I kind of like that. And it, it'll have a little bit of a cuff, but not a lot. It's just um, like a rolled cuff. It's not ribbed. And I think it's like two centimeters long. So I just feel, I just feel like that could be really cute. And especially because it is a very, like I think it does just sort of abruptly cinch in at the cuff. I think that my my typical MO with a sleeve is that I want it to be like really long. I want to be able to kind of tuck my hands up in it. But this isn't really that kind of top. And I think it's shown in the pictures as having more of sort of like a bracelet length sleeve, I think. I think you can kind of see the wrists on. I don't know. I just, as someone whose arms are always too long for clothing, <laughs> I just feel like, <laughs> I feel sensitive to feeling like my sleeves are too short and wondering if it's at an awkward length instead of the length it's supposed to be. Like, I feel like I don't understand how a bracelet length is supposed to fit because no sleeve has ever fit me correctly. Like in much the same way that when pants started being like kind of cropped like ankle length, it took me a really long time to adjust to this because I went my whole life feeling like pants that hit there were pants that were too short for me because pants were always too short for me. So I just feel like I might like this more if instead of trying and failing to understand whether I've correctly done bracelet length, to just do like a three quarter length. I love a three quarter length sleeve. I feel like that might be the answer. And I feel like it might be exactly this spot. I just, I just think that I do want to do the neck and the other side just to know how it's gonna fit. Because I do feel like when I did my ribbed mock neck, I feel like the sleeve ended up being a bit shorter than I kind of thought that it was. Despite the fact that the neck had already been done, like that doesn't even, that's not even a thing. I think it was just that I knit one sleeve and then the other and it already bound off. And like the other sleeve kind of pulled the whole garment over a little bit more than I realized was gonna happen. So I think I wanna be more sure before I do the cuff on this one, but I think that might be where I leave it. And so you can see the front part. I feel like I like where this is landing. And then the last step is picking up all the way around to start the like peplum part of the top. So I just think it's so cute. It's just so like light and airy and soft. This is very soft mohair. I'm very excited about it. I'm just gonna leave this on while I continue to talk about it. <laughs> My like half finished top. So a couple of observations from working on this. I had said in the last video that I really appreciated how simple this was to get started because it was just like, just knit a couple rectangles, worry about nothing. And I was like, am I gonna regret this later? I don't know, but right now it's fun. Did I regret it later? I only, mm, I regretted it like this much. Like there, I, I do not love the feeling of like, okay, I have to stop working on this until I have like concentrated time, right? I can't work on this just like passively while I'm like having a conversation or watching my show. Like, no, I need to like pause it and like pay attention to what I'm doing. So I never loved that part, but it wasn't complicated. There wasn't stuff to like figure out, but I did find it surprisingly tricky at first to pick up the stitches along the side here to start the sleeve. And there were, there were a couple different <laughs> facets to this. Number one, just being this fabric, like the combo of the super tiny yarn and the giant needles, I just found that made it extra fiddly to be trying to pick up stitches. Like I don't love picking up stitches at the best of times. And this was just like, what is happening? Why, <laughs> why is everything so tiny? It is a bit easier to like see what's going on in a way, I will give it that. But just the like, just trying to like get the needle in to places that it doesn't naturally want to go is just hard with this fabric combo. So that was a bit tricky at first. It did definitely get easier though, as I kind of got used to it. But the other problem that I had was, you know, you're supposed to be looking at the right side of the fabric and start picking up stitches for the sleeve. And I was pretty sure I was doing that. Now I will say it's harder to identify right side and wrong side when the fabric is this loose, because you can actually see like both the V's and the pearl bumps on both sides of the fabric right? Because it's so open. Um, the difference is just like which ones are on top, I guess. Um, and so I, I can discern the difference, but it also would be easy to like at a glance, get them wrong. So the first time I tried picking up for the sleeve, which again, I did not enjoy because I was still getting used to picking up stitches on this fabric. I was looking at the right side. I picked up my stitches. I knit a few rows and I went, why am I looking at the wrong side of the fabric? when this should be the right side of the sleeve. And I was like, did I misidentify the right side of the body panel when I started picking up stitches? Like was I just, did I just accidentally have it upside down and started picking it up that way? 
And so for a minute I was like, do I just leave it? Because again, like the different sides are not that clearly different in this open of a gauge. So like maybe the sleeves are just pearl side and maybe that's fine. Um, but then I was like, okay, but now I'm a little bit worried that when I do the other side, like if I did something weird, like what if I misunderstand what weird thing I did? Like what if I can't get the other sleeve to also be pearl side? And then they look weird. <laughs> So I was like, okay, I should, didn't take that long to get here. Like I was annoyed because I'd probably knit about this much of the sleeve by the time I noticed this. But I was like, okay, no, like just, just rip back. It's fine. It didn't take that long. I was more annoyed about having to pick up stitches again, honestly, than about having to redo the knitting. But so I went back and I was looking at the fabric and I'm like, okay, this is definitely the right side. And I start picking up stitches and I'm going, why is this looking like the wrong side again? And I realized that I was just, this, this is just my complete failure to understand like 3D spatial things um, coming to haunt me <laughs> because I realized what I was doing was like I was looking at the right side of the fabric is like laying here and I was picking up along this edge but picking it up like this way so that it's like the right side is facing me and the right side is on top and the right side of the sleeve is facing me okay good but so what that actually means with the way this fabric will fall, because this fabric is not going up my shoulder like this, it's going down my shoulder, which means that if the right side here is facing me, and this is the right side of the body panel, when it falls down my shoulder, guess what? That's the pearl side. That's the pearl side on my shoulder. So that was um, my issue. Turns out you have to think a little more about the three dimensions of this and not just be like, well, I'm looking at the right side of the body. And so if I pick up stitches, all will be well. No, you have to think about which side of the right side you're starting on and where it's, I don't, I don't even know how to explain this problem in words. And those of you who do not have this problem with 3D spatial reasoning are going to be like, what are you talking about? This makes absolutely no sense. There's no way that you could mess, like this doesn't make any sense. This could not have happened. But those of you who are like me will understand. <laughs> You'll understand why I can't explain it. So I just I just had to like think about it and figure out where I should pick up and which way I should go. Because I also have this problem when I pick up stitches where I'm like, wait, do I start from the left edge or the right edge? I this I don't like picking up stitches. <laughs> so I had to do a lot of figuring about which side I start at and how I'm looking at the fabric when I start and which side I start and and which direction I go. It just it was a whole thing. It took a few tries, but I did eventually successfully pick up stitches and start knitting right side sleeves to match my right side body. And good for me. I hope, I hope you're all very proud of me for that. I sure am. <laughs> this keeps like sliding over this way. Now, one of the other things that I have found interesting in working on this is just my like perception of the pace at which it's being knit is very influenced by this unusual construction. So like last time I was like, oh my God, this is flying. This is going so quickly because last time I had my entire front panel and I had about half of the back panel. And I was like, oh my God, I'm like almost done. The body panels. <laughs> um, jokes on me because the sleeve, and like, again, I haven't even done a full sleeve. The sleeve is like way more fabric than this entire body. And of course there's more body because there is the peplum part, but just because you don't do that until the end, like. We're not, we're not thinking about that yet. So hadn't computed. So I just was working on this sleeve and like, I only realistically worked, I probably spent like two days where I did a lot of knitting working on this sleeve. But I was like, why does it feel like this sleeve is taking so long? And like, again, two days. It's not that it actually took so long, but just compared to the body, I was like, oh my God, sleeves are supposed to be faster than the body. Like what's happening? <laughs> But the proportions are just so different in this garment that it's like all of the things that you think that you know about like the pace at which you'll knit up a garment just like do not apply. So I'm gonna need to pick up this sleeve and do that whole same thing over here. And by the time I get to the peplum, I'm gonna feel like I've just been knitting sleeves for an eternity comparatively, but I think it's gonna be worth it. It's gonna be really good. Now, one of the things that I have noticed in working with this yarn is that it definitely knits up differently depending on whether you're knitting flat or knitting in the round which makes sense. Um, and this pattern uses both, right? So the front panel is knit flat, back panel is knit flat. You start knitting the sleeve flat, like I was explaining before, because it's part of your side body. And then you join in the round. And can you see, I'll try to show you this. 
like I feel like you can see exactly where that happens because it goes from being this kind of like vague like blobby cotton candy -y combo of colors to like I mean that's a striped sleeve <laughs> right and interestingly I feel like parts of the body panels had more kind of noticeable color grouping than other parts um but none of them are striped there is a bit this this side has a bit of sort of like almost like a zigzaggy but then the back is more just kind of blobby but like that is like that is a self-striping yarn <laughs> that is very much striped and I don't I don't say this as a bad thing like I definitely like I I think it's very cute I still like it I just did not realize I guess how much it would be different from one to the other. And I think it'll be interesting to me to see how it does on the peplum, which is in the round, but will be, um, I think, kind of consistently increasing in diameter. So what will it do there? Does it only like stripe if it's kind of like exactly the right circumference or does it just vary the thickness of the stripe? I don't know. I don't know what this yarn does. I don't know. Part of me is like, should I have alternated skeins? But also like part of the way that the Wandering Flock markets is like, no, we deliberately design like our skeins and our dyeing process so that alternating the skeins isn't required. Would alternating have fixed this? Would I just have ended up with smaller stripes? I don't know. I don't know. Please let me let me know your experience with knitting Wandering Flock yarns, um, especially if you have experience with this colorway. I'm just curious mostly for like what I will end up doing with like the probably a lot of extra that I will end up having from this project because I really like how this is coming out. I have no issue with it. This was also not a project where I had like a particular image in my head going into it, right? Like I just came up with this project to use the yarn for something. So it's not like I oh, I bought this yarn because I had this very particular idea. It's not that. So like, I didn't know it was going to turn out this way, but I like how it's turning out. Great. But now that I do know this, I feel like it's something that I'm going to be thinking about when I'm deciding what to do with that leftover yarn. So TBD. Okay, that's all the knitting stuff I've got for you today. So let's get into the non-knitting creative view. I really need a name for this segment, guys. I <laughs> Every time I go to introduce this, I'm like, it's time for the time when we don't talk about knitting i don't know i i've got nothing like creative corner like no i need something i need something better so if you have an idea of what i should call this of a succinct way that i could introduce this segment please let me know but as usual that segment includes books so let's get into our finished object you've seen this book before if you've been on this channel before. This was my reading whip the last time that I posted and I think it was my reading acquisition the time before that. So this time it has graduated into a finished object and I just, this was just like so much fun. Like I don't know, <laughs> I don't really know what else to say. That's not true. I have more things to say. Oh and there's a copper here. Um, so this book by Christine Riccio, the premise, if you haven't heard me explain this before, is that it's basically um, Survivor meets The Bachelor. It's like the main character is on the show that she she thinks she's going on Survivor but gets cast on like this weird spinoff that has like a romance element to it. As a near lifelong fan of The Bachelor, I mean I've been having my brain rotted by that show since like the age of 12. And a more recent fan of Survivor, I binged a lot of it during the pandemic, <laughs> um, this was just a delight. Oh, Copper's here just out of frame. Hi! Hello. <laughs> there he is. Godfrey is joining us. Um, he is wet because um, I'm filming this on a Wednesday and Wednesday is bath day for poor Copper who has seasonal allergies and needs a weekly um, dermatological treatment shampoo. So <laughs> he's welcome for that. He hates it. But so this book just like delivered on the premise. Like there's a concept in writing and story structure called the promise of the premise. And so the whole idea is that like every book should like have a hook right it should have some like compelling concept that's what gets people interested in the first place this is often what's going to kind of lead your like flap copy your blurb and it's really important that your book delivers on that because if that turns out to just be kind of like a really small part of the book that doesn't really get gotten into grammar in a satisfactory way your reader is going to be disappointed and 
So obviously there's like a range of how much you can deliver on that premise, right? How much time you spend dwelling in that premise. Like, like as an example, I think The Hunger Games is a really clear way to explain this, where obviously the premise of The Hunger Games that you're sold on is it's these kids in this like battle to the death kind of situation. But the reality is that like, of course, that's not what the whole book is, right? We're not like page one Katniss is in there. We have a whole first act where there's all the setup and Katniss deciding to take her sister's place and all these things. And I believe, if I remember correctly, it's like right at the start of Act 2 that like that's when suddenly she's in there and that's when the promise of the premise begins. And that is typical to story structure, like beginning of second act is kind of when you should be really delivering on that premise. This book delivers on the premise like start to finish. <laughs> like, I mean, not literally, there is obviously a bit of setup to like getting her in this scenario, but I could not have asked for a better execution of the story. And so I've, I've read Christine's two books before and I liked them, but they were not five star books for me. Like th three and a half, four stars, you know? This was a five star read. Like I just, I just had the best time. I don't, it was so good. It was pretty fast paced, but also I am very much like a character forward kind of reader. Like I would happily read books with no plot whatsoever. And I loved the main character. I loved her journey. I was rooting for her. I also, I just feel like Christine did such a good job of like delivering to the Survivor fan in writing this. Like it's very clear that she's like a huge fan of the show and has watched a ton of it. And sure enough, like I get to her acknowledgements and she says something about like having binged every single season of Survivor as part of like prepping for this book. And it shows. So in the book, actually one of the things that really struck me is that they talk about Survivor by name in this book, which I think usually books don't do, right? Like usually things are kind of like thinly veiled allusions to real life things that are presented under some like weird off brand name in a book, right? Like instead of using Twitter, a character will be on like Tweetly. <laughs> and like, I just, I, I understand that this is often a problem of like intellectual property. And like, I, I get that there, there are reasons people aren't doing this just to annoy me, but it does tend to like pull me out of the reading experience a little bit because I just find it like cringy when I like know what you're referring to but you're caging it I just I just can't help but feel a little like what every time that happens and so I don't know if they had to get like permission or what because like it is very integral to the story like actually in the text the show she's on is an actual spin-off of the Survivor franchise so it's very much tethered. It's not even like, oh, we're just going to mention it offhand. It's like, no, it's kind of implying things like about the company that like makes Survivor. So I feel like there must have been some rights involved here. I don't know. But so I, just, I really appreciated that, that which has like nothing to do with like the quality of writing. That's a rights thing. But I also feel like Christine just did such a clever job of like taking very recognizable mechanics of the Survivor game. So if you've watched Survivor, you will recognize like the types of challenges, the types of puzzles, the types of um, like advantages, like all of these things will be very familiar, but she has tweaked them to suit the like romance angle of this fictional spinoff show in ways that make so much sense. And they're also so much fun and so satisfying. And like you absolutely do not need to be familiar with Survivor to understand what's going on and to enjoy it but they are such fun kind of like, oh, I see what you did there <laughs> kind of moments if you do know Survivor really well. It was just a blast. It felt like such good like summer reading. It's also a very quick read because, I mean, the chapters are very short. It's one of those books where chapters are like three, four pages. And then some of the chapters even are like transcripts of like her kind of in the moment interviews. So like, it just, it's such a fast read. It's so satisfying. 10 out of 10, five stars, great time, recommend. <laughs> And then shocking exactly no one, I also have a book acquisition. So fun fact, the town that I live in doesn't actually have a bookstore, which I don't feel good about. <laughs> There's a quote from Neil Gaiman where he's like, a town is not a town without a bookshop. And I agree. And I feel like I don't live in a town. So... I mean, okay, that's not entirely true. It's not that there's not a bookshop, but it's that it's like a Kohl's in a mall, you know? It's like a chain. I mean like an independent bookstore. So the closest independent bookstore to me is like 25 minutes away, which isn't far, but for some reason, um, I've lived in this house for three years and I've never been there. <laughs> so it's just like kind of in a place that I don't go for anything else. So it just hadn't happened, but it's finally happened. So I last week went to check out Blue Heron Books in Uxbridge and I picked up this Summer Will Be Different by Carly Fortune. And this is sort of a surprise pick for me in that I've heard a lot about her books, but never paid any attention. 
Like I don't read a lot in the adult romance category. I picked up an Emily Henry book. I know there's like a lot of hype around her. And I, I, I liked it, but it was like a three star read for me. I just didn't feel like super sucked in. And I honestly, which one did I read? Here's, okay, let me, let me complain about something for a second. Uh, publishing goes through like trend waves of the kinds of titles that books are given. You know, like for a while we were in this phase of um, like YA fantasy really reigning supreme and the style was like a court of thorns and roses. It was like a blank of blank and blank. And like every title was just like that. <laughs> and right now I feel like the title style that we're in is like common phrases, just like turns of phrase cliches even and, not, and sometimes like a play on a cliche but because they're so common I find them like completely indistinguishable <laughs> and so I have this problem where I'm like I don't know what that book was called I've I've never had so much trouble remembering the titles of books as I have in the last I would say like five-ish years that this has kind of been a thing. So one sec, I'm gonna like look up the title of Emily Henry books just to just to try to figure this out. Okay, so Emily Henry titles. We have Beach Read, Book Lovers, Funny Story. These are just all two word phrases that I hear all the time and are completely interchangeable to me. I don't know. So looking at the covers, I can tell you that the one I've read is Book Lovers. Could I have told you that any other way? No. Anyway, so I don't tend to read a lot in the romance category, but I do sometimes get enticed to pick up a particular one when I kind of like hear the right things about it. So I actually decided to pick up a Carly Fortune book in general. When I was listening to one of my favorite podcasts is called Be There in Five. And if you're not familiar with it, the host Kate, she basically just like deep dives very like millennial nostalgic kind of topics like I think I first got sucked in on like a two hour long episode she did talking about like the Mary Kate and Ashley movies <laughs> which like I was raised on those movies <laughs> let me know if you also were she also did an incredible episode deep diving Abercrombie and its whole trajectory from like being like the cool kid store to then like all of the terrible things that came out about them and like of course we like knew there were probably terrible practices going on if everyone working there was like hot in this one very specific way right like you don't you don't get a store staff like that without shady practices so <laughs> it's kind of this whole like expose period that she covers and into the kind of like total reset and like rebrand that they're on now and trying to kind of like correct that course more effectively than i ever would have expected a brand that like started out over here Anyway, <laughs> I love Kate's podcast and she had Carly Fortune on. She doesn't actually interview a lot of people, but she did an episode interviewing Carly Fortune. And I don't know, just hearing an author talk about their writing, I think just there, there's like not a more effective way to sell me a book. <laughs> so I decided I needed to pick up a Carly Fortune book. Her conversation with Kate was just so much fun. And I was like, I feel like I just, I feel like I would have a good time in this like little world that you're talking about. And I don't know if it even needs to be a particular one because she talked the most about her new book, but she did also touch on like past ones. So I was kind of open to picking up whatever. When I was at the Blue Heron, they have a whole little section of signed books. And I love a signed book. I love going to book signings. I love meeting authors. Well, okay. I love having met authors. I love having them sign my books. I am very stressed about the like 60 second interaction that you have with them because like, I just always feel like, what am I possibly gonna say to you in this interaction that's going to be like meaningful for either of us? Like, I don't just wanna be like, hi, how are you? I loved your book. Like that just feels so like trite and like, you probably heard that exact same thing from the like 200 people ahead of me in line. I don't know. It just feels like a weird use of both of our time. But on the other hand, like how could I possibly like give you a well thought out and like thorough sense of not only how much, but particularly what I appreciated about your book. Like that's not going to happen in that duration either. And especially when I'm like, a little bit like nervous about me that like it's just it's not gonna come out right I like having met them anyway all this to say I was really excited to see a section of signed books <laughs> and I didn't have to meet her oh no oh is that where the camera was I don't know anyway all that to say 
this book is signed. Look at her cute signature. I don't know. There's something to me about having a signed book where I, it, it definitely like counts for a bit more for me if like the author signed it when I met them. But there is still something to me about a signed book, even if I didn't meet the author, where it's like, yes, an author like wrote this book, but then it was just like mass produced in like this giant printing facility and assembled by like robots. You know, her like physical human touch in no way went into this actual object until it was signed. And there's something to me in that, like bringing back the like human hand of the person who created it into something. It just, it just gives it like a little bit more of a soul to me, you know, I don't know. <laughs> so the premise of this book is that the main character sort of goes on a summer trip to Prince Edward Island and she meets someone who she doesn't realize is her best friend's brother. And um, they kind of start to fall for each other and it's kind of a problem. And just the way that Carly on Kate's podcast was talking about um, sort of the setting being such a big part of this. Like I know that in my own writing, I really love leaning into where a story takes place and like making that a really big part of it. And I just, I guess I really value the like sense of atmosphere that you get from that. And I was just very much getting the vibe from Carly that that's going to be a really big part of this book. And I'm really excited to spend the summer in this little world. And then in kind of a new category in our non-knitting segment, I don't think it's come up very much before that I play piano. And this came up in the first episode because I mentioned that this camera is set up on top of my piano, <laughs> but that's about it. Um, I've been playing piano since I was four, um, but I have a very like, um, fraught <laughs> relationship with it. Maybe you could say, here's the thing. I like playing the piano. I hate practicing the piano. And turns out when you're learning piano, you have to practice it a lot. And if you don't practice, you can't play stuff anymore. And I think part of it is like, if, if, if you're also a very like type A kind of person, you, you might understand this. Like, I don't like being bad at things. <laughs> I think most of my hobbies and even like my job as a graphic designer are things that I just kind of like have a natural aptitude for like they just kind of like came to me pretty easily and like of course there's always like stuff to learn and to like get better at um but they're they're not things where there was a lot of like uphill struggle steep learning curve kind of thing and i think knitting is, is very much like that <laughs> for me piano is not like that some people are very gifted some people um can like hear a song and then just like play it I don't, I don't have that ability. I don't have any sense of like pitch. If you played a note on the piano when I wasn't looking and then asked me to play that same note, good luck to me. I have no real ability to like improvise and come up with anything. I just, I'm just not musically gifted. <laughs> like everything that I can do on the piano is the result of practice and deliberate learning. Like it is all study and no talent. <laughs> But it turns out that when you don't practice for years and years, the repertoire of things that you can just sit down and play really dwindles <laughs> over time. Until basically the start of this year, I was like, I can play like one song sort of, um, and maybe I should like practice this whole being bad at things thing. So I started learning a song. When I've sat down and just wanted to play in recent years, I've pulled out like the kitty sheet music you know i have like disney sheet music books that are at the like easy piano level like things that i was playing when i was like eight and so this year i was like hey no we're gonna we're gonna actually find sheet music of a song that you really want to play that is actually at the level that you spend like 13 years of your life <laughs> building up to be able to play so i landed on the song how far i'll go from the movie moana because i love that movie i love that song and sometimes it's there are a lot of songs that are really beautiful songs that don't translate all that well to the piano, um, but this was one where I managed to find an arrangement that I really liked a bit, and it's a fairly difficult arrangement. I think it's labeled like late intermediate. I don't know. I, I did the like Royal Conservatory program, so if it's not in like numbered grade levels, I don't really understand what that means, but I can tell you it was hard. <laughs> it took me a really long time. I kind of decided like, okay, I'm gonna do like 10 solid minutes a day, which I mean does not sound like a lot, and it's, it's not compared to how much I was supposed to be practicing when I was actually Actually, like in piano lessons but if you really strategically and in a very focused way practice for 10 minutes you can actually like make some real progress on a song as long as you are here's the key practicing like properly and not just like flubbing your way through it you make progress and so it took me probably a couple months to like learn all the way through the end of the song 
Um, and then since then I've been working on memorizing it, which probably took me longer than learning the whole song to start with <laughs> because I'm not great at memorizing songs either. Um, but I finally finished it. I wasn't really like planning on this being part of the channel at all, but I'm really pleased with myself for learning a hard song start to finish for the first time in probably over a decade. So you know what? I'm gonna pop it at the end of this video while the like end cards are there and it's usually just like a shot of my library. It's gonna be me playing Moana. So you can stick around for that if you want. You don't have to. It's probably boring. I don't blame you. But thanks so much for watching if you got this far. If you'd like to be here next time, please consider subscribing and I'll catch you soon. Bye.